Okay, the second part of uh, module one will be again on understanding and identifying risk, but I'll be looking at systemic risk first, right? Like I did mention uh, at the beginning of module one, part one, that we tend to look at systemic risks more now, especially with COVID-19, because we have an interconnectedness of system and agents. That is, for example, with COVID-19, uh, we've seen how countries are highly connected, right? And risk can move to other countries or shocks can move to other countries very quickly because of this interconnectedness across system or across countries, across regions. So because of this interconnectedness of system, then there will be an interactions of different individual risks, which at the same time can lead to a number of effects, right? So systemic risk occur when systems are highly connected with one another. So much that a shock or a stress in a given area will have a number of consequences, impact, or we talk about cascading damages to other areas or to other uh, system. So Cascading disruptions or consequences have been growing over time, and these have important implications for communities. When we talk about interconnectedness of system, then and the risk which come along, which have a number of consequences, we say that this interconnectedness of system generate a domino effect affecting a number of, of uh, elements like infrastructural, social, economic, or environmental system. So systemic risk infiltrate, I would say, across complex system. And it's very difficult to contain them. We've seen that with, for instance, the global financial crisis in 2008, where it started with failures of financial firms and then ended up with a substantial collapse across various countries in the world. Similarly, we've seen that uh, with the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It started in one in December 2019, but has spread throughout the world, generating not only a health crisis, but also a social and economic downfall across many countries. This has been the case mainly because of a number of health containment measures, travel restrictions, lockdown, border closures, uh, mobility restrictions, among others. So it has shown to us, because our world or our system is very much connected, then a risk can go to not can go to all the countries, right? And it's very difficult to contain that. And COVID-19 has been a true example showing us what happened uh, in terms of a systemic risk. We look at risk and we've looked at that, we've, we've explained the different types of risk. And sometimes we want to try to measure risk from the different components. The three components that we look at when we talk about risk is the hazard. We talk about hazard, the probability of the hazard happening, the exposure, and vulnerability. So I can write the risk equation as risk equal to probability of hazard times exposure times vulnerability. I will now explain the different parts of that risk equation. Hazard we've already explained, right? So let's see the exposure part of it. 
Exposure is a situation where people, infrastructure, housing, production capacities, or other tangible assets are located in hazard-prone areas, right? So if you are in an area, in an area where you are highly exposed to sea level rise, for example, on the coastal region, so then you are exposed to that, then the consequences will tend to be much higher. But it could be that a hazard occur in an area of no exposure. Yeah, that is the population or any economic resources are not located there in that particular area. In that case, there is no risk problem. But exposure, I would say, is a necessary but not sufficient determinant of risk. The extent to which individuals or economic assets are at risk is determined by how vulnerable they are, as it is possible for you to be exposed, but you're not vulnerable, right? First, we've seen that, okay, exposure is necessary, but not necessarily a sufficient determinant of risk. There is also that aspect of vulnerability. So it is possible to be exposed to threats or hazard. For example, you're living in a floodplain. Yeah, you don't have sufficient means to modify the infrastructure. Then in that case, you are vulnerable. But if you have sufficient means to modify the, the infrastructure buildings and adopt the relevant measures to mitigate the potential losses that you will encounter, then you're not vulnerable. Yeah, so there is increasing evidence on the premise that in cases of extreme hazard, the degree of risk is a consequence of exposure more, the more you're exposed to that, than it is a result of vulnerability. For the simple reason that it depends as to whether you are vulnerable or not. If you have the capacity to, to mitigate the impact of the threat on your living, then you're not vulnerable. So when we look back at the risk equation, the probability of hazard has been explained, exposure to that hazard, and of course, vulnerability. Exposure and vulnerability tend to be used interchangeably as well, but they are very distinct because you can be exposed, but doesn't mean that you are vulnerable if you have the capacity to reduce the impact of that threat on your livelihood. Sometimes the risk equation can be amended to replace exposure by deficiencies in preparedness or capacity to mitigate the impacts of the hazard or future threats. What are deficiencies in preparedness? They are pre-existing conditions that prevent institutions or communities or countries from responding to that hazard and as such minimize its impact. So you, are not, you don't have the conditions necessary to prepare yourself uh, against that threat. So your risk equation is slightly modified instead of having exposure there, we can remove exposure and replace it by deficiencies in preparedness. And the other terms in the equation like probability of hazard and vulnerability remain there. The other term which we use a lot when we talk about risk and vulnerability, how to manage these risks and to reduce your vulnerability, another term which becomes very important is your capacity. Capacity is linked to the positive features of people, characteristics, and resources that may help to reduce risk. So an improvement in capacity, whether via projects or policies, can reduce risk. It's your ability, for instance, as a household, to reduce uh, the threat of any, to reduce the threat or the consequences of any shock or stress. 
So threats, vulnerabilities, capacity are distinct components that explain risk or can be used to reduce risk. For example, if I increase my capacity or a country increase its capacity to deal with, with droughts uh, or cyclones, let's say, or floods, right? So uh, in that case, increasing your capacity as a country to deal with, uh, with any kind of hazard or threats, this will reduce the risk or reduce vulnerability as well. And also you can reduce the threat which is there. So a threat represents the source of the risk while capacities refer to the ability of individuals, household, communities or countries to mitigate, to reduce that threat or to reduce the consequences of that particular threat. With capacity, you're not only reducing the impact of threat, but you can make the recovery time shorter. Yeah, it's easier for households or communities to recover from a shock if you have that ability to reduce the impact of the shock. Capacity, however, needs assets, opportunities, social networks, financing, good institutions to deal with the threats, and also to recover from these threats or hazard. When we talk about capacity, we need to differentiate between coping capacity and adaptive capacity. Coping capacity happens like exposed actions, right? After, after the event. Adaptive capacity is the ability to anticipate and transform structures, system, to better survive the threats. Now, they are different. And of course, the needs will be different depending as to whether you are adopting coping capacity or adaptive capacity. So whenever we refer to capacity, it's capacity to anticipate risk, capacity to respond to risk, and capacity to recover and change. People, in fact, do not have to devote substantial resources to deal with hazard as they occur, but they have the capacity to anticipate the threats. This is very important. So anticipating risk, for instance, in the case of climate change, for example, uh, land management, uh, planning, uh, having disaster risk structures, right? Uh, institutions which plan uh, what will happen in case of, let's say, a flood or drought, etc. Uh, so anticipating this, having the capacity to anticipate will reduce exposure and vulnerability to threats. For example, as a household, if you depend only on food crop and there is a drought, what you can do is you diversify your income sources. Maybe you invest in other activities so that you, re you reduce your vulnerability uh, to that drought, right? You have still other income sources which can help you to have a, a decent livelihood. So there are ways uh, and means trying to anticipate uh, uh, any kind of risk which may happen. Capacity to respond to risk. This is very important. So we talked about response capacity in terms of ability of institutions to react following a natural hazard. How do they respond to flash flood? How do they respond to, uh, to a given threat? So what are the investment needed? What are, what, what are the planning uh, resources there uh, that are there for countries. So it's very important to be able to respond to risk, to reduce the damages, to reduce the secondary damages which can occur. The capacity to recover and change is also fundamental. So 
how do you adapt to climate change, for example? What are the set of actions that need to be there uh, to recover? It's not only physical impact, but also how can people get back to the activities like before the threat? How can they resume their livelihood activities? So these three dimensions, these, I would say these three uh, capacity to anticipate risk, capacity to respond to risk, and capacity to recover and change are crucial in capacity behaviors and actions of when you deal with threats, shocks, or stresses. So whenever we, we look at hazard exposure and vulnerability, we bring them together. And most studies on risk have been increasingly focusing on vulnerability and linking up hazard exposure, risk, and vulnerability. So when we talk about a uh, risk, there are three important components. Hazard, we mentioned that, exposure, vulnerability. This, the intersection of these three components together yields to risk. And we've seen that uh, in terms of the risk equation. The next dimension, which we will be spending more time on in module two and three is vulnerability. In fact, vulnerability itself begins with a notion of risk. Yeah, they are highly related. By including vulnerability, it shows that risk doesn't only depend on the severity of the hazard, but on the number of people or asset exposed, and also on the vulnerability of these people or assets, right? They will be suffering from loss or damages. So it goes beyond only the hazard. It looks at the impact and how vulnerable people are as a result of that shock and stress. In a situation of extreme risk, vulnerability is the greatest factor in determining risk. In fact, there are many aspects of vulnerability. It's very, very broad. But the two dimensions that we will be focusing on in that course will be vulnerability to natural hazard and vulnerability to poverty and deprivation. Vulnerability to poverty and depreciation is very important, especially for many developing countries, including African economies. Vulnerability itself is very complex. Telling people to define vulnerability, it's very, it's very difficult to do so because the term itself is very difficult. There are different definitions of vulnerability. There is no one definition of it. Different definitions of vulnerability across different areas, different fields. And that's why we talk about vulnerability being multidimensional. It has different components. And it's complex, yes. It's multidimensional with different dimensions that we will talk later. It arises at the micro level, meso level, macro level. We've mentioned that. But at the end of the day, what we want to show is that vulnerability is a state of defenselessness against shocks that inflict damage to a system, whether it's a person, household, community, or an economy. And that vulnerability changes over time. It's dynamic. So it's not static. So which makes it more difficult to measure and to define. So we talk about the risk equation. What about the vulnerability equation? So we, when we talk about vulnerability equation, we have exposure. Uh, and then we include another notion of coping capacity which we mentioned earlier, right? So where coping capacity is the use of available resources and capacities to face the adverse consequences of threats or hazard. And we need to know that when we talk about vulnerability, some groups of people are more vulnerable compared to others. So that's why we talk about vulnerable groups. They, they are more likely to be vulnerable to damage, losses, etc compared to others, which makes them have higher levels of vulnerability. 
this is end of module one. And we've been talking about the different aspects there, the different terminologies and trying to link them. But in module two, we'll be focusing more on vulnerability. Thank you.